Good morning, everyone, and or good afternoon, or whenever this gets up on the web. Uh, welcome to The View. We are having a big pile of technical difficulties this morning, so this is not a live show. You are watching our wonderful show um, in, in its recorded form that we hope will actually take. Um, this is Michael Tino. I'm joining you from Peekskill, New York, where it is um, a beautiful late summer uh summer day here um fall is happening and uh the pumpkins have been harvested from my garden um and life is good how are you Asia hauser out there on the west coast yeah it's bright and early it's Asia hauser i'm in seattle washington it's a gray day and drizzly i think and i actually like it when it's gray because when it's too sunny for too many days it reminds me about what's happening to the earth which i know i should keep foremost in my mind of course um, so I'm actually fine with cloudy weather. We have an apple tree. I'm in Washington state in our yard and every other year they're edible. So there it is. I'm sure we're supposed to be doing something different to make them tasty every year, but I will, I've been here six years and I have no idea what that is. So, um, that's me and, uh, Antonia, how are you? Oh, I am doing okay. I'm in Wilmington, Delaware, and it was chilly this morning when I took my kids to school. So, and I am trying my best not to turn on the furnace, the, the oil heat. So I am cold a little bit in my house, but it's okay because I have heat. So, yeah. Um, so that's what I am doing, and I am excited to be in our recorded <laughs> view room. I'll try to ask lots so, of questions. So, Antonia, you can join us as as a co-host this week because um, you won't be monitoring anything live. Yes, uh, that's so great. We're sorry for those of you watching this on Facebook that you cannot ask questions of our guests live, uh, and we will uh, be really brief with what's going on in the in the UU world today. Um, tomorrow is the the global climate strike and um, Unitarian Universalists all over are participating in that. Our association has endorsed it. Our president, Susan Frederick Gray, will be uh, leading the prayer service uh, at Community Church of New York uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Uh, before the march down to, uh, to Battery Park with Greta Thunberg. Um, so that's very exciting. Uh, other other folks yeah uh, I'm uh, be going to my local one because it's four <laughs> blocks from my house and i don't feel like i oh, should good i should get on a train and go to new york city when i can walk to one given that this is about how we treat our planet yeah seattle will have a big one and um I, folks are just being asked to um yeah go to the local one uh, wherever is near them so it's an interesting thing that happened in seattle in new york city i believe the children are getting up uh, uh, I was gonna say a free day, excuse day. Mm -hmm. um, and Seattle, they're not. And so we have a POC Seattle uh, Facebook group and someone mentioned, and I thought it was a very good point. The point of striking is to give something up is, is that it, it shouldn't be this parade of fun. It's actually, it's fine if you get, if you get an absent and that you're actually sacrificing something and absent to show up and um, in solidarity of the earth and what um, the, the children's climate strike around the world is asking us to do. So I thought that was interesting that Seattle said, no, you're not getting uh, an excuse and do it anyway, you know, it, that's, that's okay. Yeah, I guess we could, you know, debate whether, <laughs> which, which approach is better. I know that the, a lot of students in New York are very happy that their absence will not be held against them academically. Um, because they would have taken it if it had been. So, uh, other things that we should mention, Aisha? The invite, uh, so our Unitarian Universalist Association, uh, partly to follow up with General Assembly in Spokane and the power of we, issued um, tools for congregations to engage in what's titled an invitation to conversations for liberty. So I'm just gonna read the first paragraph so that I'm not trying to um, quote, I mean, uh, paraphrase. We are at a moment of great power and potential in Unitarian Universalism. The organization signing this letter recognize the need to act with a common framework for leadership in this moment. Unitarian Universalists have charted a new path to create a faith movement where people of all backgrounds and identities can thrive to challenge systems of oppression, patriarchy, and white supremacy at all levels. 
We have begun to make progress in reimagining and diversifying our leadership and our communities. We are beginning to make good on the promise that generations of our faith forebears have made. And so um, the signature, signatories are UUA, UUA Commission on Institutional Change, Allies for Racial Equity, the um, Ministers Association, administrators, musicians, religious educators, trans religious professionals, um, Unitarian Universalists together, and uh, the ministers. So and, and powerful. drama as well. And drama. Okay, they they should be listed there. Mm -hmm. They are not. Um, but yes. <laughs> oh, I see. They're there. They're there. My bad. Sorry, drum. I love you all. Diverse and revolutionary. Thank you. So um, powerful resources that affirm who we want to be in the world. So I super appreciate the efforts put in by all who collaborated on this effort. Yeah, and maybe a future view, because this just came out, what, the day before yesterday. And so we haven't even had the chance to, uh, <laughs> to process this, but Conversations for Liberation probably should be a future view, don't you think, Aisha Hauser? Oh, that's happening, so yes. <laughs> Well, fantastic. Let's just get into our guests here uh, before we uh, let any more time fritter away, because I know that, Aisha, you have to go precisely on the hour, and so we'll have a little shortened episode today. To say that um, our other two regular hosts, Meg Riley, uh, had a pastoral care emergency, and Christina Rivera had um, some, some health issues that needed to be taken care of ASAP, and we're glad that she's getting them taken care of. Uh, so. So we'll count them in the pile of technical difficulties, uh, Christina's shoulder and, and Meg's pastoral care emergency uh, that we're facing, as we welcome three members of the UUA moderator search committee to our show, uh, Kim Hampton, Kimberly Debus, and Denise Rimes. Um, I am not going to read y'all's bios uh, because we just like don't have time for that. And um, we're so glad that you're here uh, representing our moderator search committee. I understand that uh, applications are due October 1st. Um, how many do you have? Right now, we have a big fat zero, but there's still 12 days for people to get their applications in. Um, and we've had some people expressing some interest, asking some questions, so we know that there's some rumbling um, and, and hopefully we'll see a flood on the first. Um, but we're, you know, we don't know how many people are still on the fence and are thinking about applying and aren't sure what they should do and need an extra nudge. And I'm hoping that this episode of The View is at least part nudge <laughs> for those who are thinking about it. So if I were listening to this show, today and thinking, you know, I'm interested in this, but I'm just not sure, like, I don't know that I can do it. I don't know that I'm who they're looking for. Um, what do you have to tell me that that would get me to apply? Denise or Kim? Yeah, just unmute before you talk. Awesome. Well, first of all, if you know, for for all of the details, the um, the job description and lots of other information um, is posted through the UUA website. So if you just search on Moderator 2020 in the search in the search field, um, it'll take you to the you know click on the link and you're you're able to read all of the um, all of the description. It's a big job and what we've heard about, uh, or what we've heard from a lot of people is, gosh, it's too big for, for one person and you know, maybe two people, but it's a huge time commitment and you have to be retired and wealthy in order to do the job. And I would say that's not, that's not necessarily the case. We are definitely encouraging teams uh, you know, co-moderators of whatever combination makes sense for a team uh, to apply. And I would, there, there's some things in place that help a little bit with, uh, with what seems to people to be an enormous amount of work. Um, so I just want to speak to that for, for just a minute. First of all, the board itself is very strong. There are tremendous talents, diversity of talents and gifts on the board. And so many hands, I've been saying this a lot lately, many hands make light work. 
So a good leader who can delegate effectively um, or leaders who can delegate effectively um, can certainly leverage the board to, uh, to get the work done. We have a lot of uh, institutionalized practices that a really good leader or leadership team could change. Just because the practices have been around for a long time doesn't mean they're the right practices. So uh, for the, those who are visionary and can see the work being done in a different way, uh, I think there are massive opportunities for individuals or teams of folks to come in and not only lead the current board and the, the association from a governance perspective, but look at ways of doing it differently and really bust, bust the paradigm. Um, Denise, so can those I jump some, in and ask? Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask, because you're an outgoing board member and you were on the board, um, you've served with one, more than one moderator, so one of the things that I did read, not that I'm interested, is um, I think it's 20 or 30 hours maybe. Um, but to me, I, was, I think 20 or 30 hours a week, right? That's a lot. And so even if there's two people, I was like, huh, would that really be 10 hours a person or more like 20 a person? Um, and then it adds up to a full-time job. So having been on the board yourself, um, what do you, in, in terms of time commitment, because board members give as much time. I mean, it is a, a board position based, I mean, it's moderator and you're all working together. What, what was the most difficult part of, of being a volunteer on such a busy board for you? The ex managing the expectations of our congregations and individual members. I would say clearly that, and that's what I was talking about in terms of some of the traditional behaviors and practices, um, we have to change the way we think about the volunteers. And, and, and the board is completely volunteer for, uh, for a number of reasons, um, as opposed to a paid, paid job. And we can certainly chat about that if anybody's interested. Um, so I would say um, the job can certainly be done in less hours than that. Uh, if you're brand new to leadership, uh, or if you have a team, again, or an individual or teams of, of folks who are interested, um, the learning curve could be steep. But I do think that there are different ways to lead the association without it being all-consuming. Congregations expect that the moderator or moderators will be the ones to show up at their installations and their ordinations and their building dedications. And I understand that, but again, we've got a lot of really good board members, um, some of whom are ministers, many of whom have great public speaking and crowd skills, if you will. Um, and so you can make it what you want it if you have a vision of what it could be. And I think our current moderators have been working on that, but it's really hard to get people to get busted out of what they're used to. Did that answer your question, Aisha? Yes, it did. And, and you gave examples of people wanting you to come to probably ribbon cutting ceremonies and maybe fundraising. And that's just not a thing with a thousand congregations. Um, Kim, I'm curious, Kim Hampton, because we have Kimberly Davis and Kimberly Hampton. Uh, Kim Hampton, what are you looking for? What, what are some quali- Thank you, uh, Denise. What are some things you're looking for? And hi, Nori, which means my light in Arabic, Nori. So she definitely is our light. I guess it helps if I unmute. Um, I think we're looking for uh, either a person or people, number one, who aren't new. And it doesn't mean you have to have been around for 150 years. It just means you can't have showed up yesterday. Um, somebody who knows that somebody or somebody's who know that they're part of a team and they're that just because they're moderator it doesn't mean that they have to do it by themselves and 
they can't do by themselves. Hold on, Nuri's getting ready to move for a second. So, um, okay. um, and that, yes, it is a lot of work, but the work can be and should be shared and it helps if they have a strong spiritual grounding. And of course, she she cries or makes noise as soon as she leaves me. So, yeah, I want to um, jump on to something Kim said about uh, a strong spiritual grounding. You know, I mean, let's not fool ourselves. This has been a tumultuous few years. And between just the controversies plus some deaths and, and other difficulties, this is a board that needs someone who is strong enough in their own faith that they can also sort of hold the board and, and hold some of that in care. Um, you know, and, and as, as a moderator or a moderator team are helping the board vision and, and enact new ways of being, some of that really has to be grounded in, in care, in pastoral presence and, and holding people who, some of whom, you know, have lost dear friends and have been through the ringer. Um, I'm glad that you brought that up. I have um, a couple of questions. Um, Kim, when you say that not someone new, I think that I'd love more information about why not someone new? And also, what new really means? Does it mean not new to Unitarian Universalism? Does it, you know, just a little bit of broader explanation of that. And then the second thing I want to ask is, what do you say to people who may have the skills that we're looking for and the knowledge that you all are looking for, but say that they believe that Unitarian Universalism is fracturing and they don't want any of the political turmoil that comes with being the moderator of this association at this time. What, what can we say to people that have all of the things that we're looking for, but just don't want to get back into a fight again, especially in situations where people's careers can be ruined because they chose to serve the UA? Um, let's see. I'll start with the second question first. Um, if you think you're not going to be political, don't apply. It's as simple as that. Because no matter what you do, somebody is going to get mad. Somebody's going to get sad. And if you can't deal with somebody getting mad or sad, don't apply. Simple. Nothing against you. We love you. Hope you stick around. Don't apply. Um, for the first question, um, what do I mean by not new? Part of it is time. Again, you don't have to have been around your whole lifetime. But you can't be fresh off the street. And that's not anything against people who are fresh off the street. You know, we love them too. Um, it's, you don't have to be enmeshed in the system but you actually have to have some knowledge of the workings of the system. So even if you want to change the system, you actually have to know the system you want to change. And somebody who is fresh off the street has no clue. And especially if there's somebody who, if we combine the two questions together, doesn't want to be political and fresh off the street, yeah, that's a recipe for disaster. So. I don't know if that answers the first question. Yeah, what I hear you saying is that for people who are having those two experiences, it sounds like there are plenty of places that they can 
serve in the UUA that you would encourage them to do those things there first until they can Most get definitely, you know, if they have a congregation, you know, maybe start at their congregation or if they're, if they're more used to, if they're more used to their congregation, they can do something on the regional level or less national level and still be effective. I think too, you know, more to the second question, we're going through a sea change as a denomination and we're, we're revisioning what it means to be an Unitarian Universalist in the 21st century. We're, we're interrogating who we've been and who we are and who we want to be. And that ship is already sailing. Um, and, you know, we're hoping, you know, we're expecting that applicants, whether individuals or a team, have a sense of that and a commitment to that, to that work. I'm wondering, um, I'm sure that you've had this conversation, uh, whether you um, are encouraging ordained folks, uh, clergy members to apply or not, and why, why or why not is sort of my, my question, because I know that when I was on the board, uh, we, uh, the board uh, nominated Jim and Tamara to run for for moderator when I was serving on the UUA board. And at that point, the moderator search committee made the decision that they were not forwarding to the board the names of any um, ordained clergy uh, for that role because they thought it was important that the moderator be a lay leader. Um, and I'm wondering if that's changed um, or not and why or why not? I don't know who wants to answer that question. It's, uh, it's interesting. The board actually um, wrote the job description. The moderator search committee uh, refined it. Um, when the job description came to us from the board, it said religious, I think it says specifically religious professionals um, are encouraged to apply. Um, so the answer to your question is it depends. <laughs> um, and you know, we want we want the the most skilled people who have the capacity and the knowledge and the desire to do their job, to do the job. So, you know, can a can a parish minister be a parish minister and the moderator of the UUA? Uh, you know, we'll we go really deep on that to try to understand if that's the case. Um, how about a DRE? We'd go deep on that to see if that's really the case. Um, if it's an ordained person who, uh, or credentialed person who maybe doesn't have a full-time engagement, you know, that, that could provide another dimension. So it really does depend on the individual or, or individuals on the, you know, on a co-moderator team and what they bring to the job and what, what they're willing to put into the job. So we're not ruling out anybody in that regard. My teammates agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we are seeking balance and, and there is some, you know, there's some thought to lean against religious professionals, just simply the idea that some of these decisions directly impact their um, their careers. On the other hand, you know, some teams may be beautifully blended. So you're getting voices from a variety of communities within Unitarian Universalism. And it really is a lot about balance. You know, a full-time minister of a mid-sized congregation isn't going to have time to even say the word moderator, no less be one. Um, but, you know, maybe a part-time minister with some other you know, with a religious educator or some other really strong lay leaders may be a really appealing team. Um, so we're keeping all of that in mind. What are some lessons learned from, um, because the first time there were co-moderators were uh, Barb Grieve and Melandria Williams. Um, and of course we had the co-presidents for six weeks. What were some, le what have been, this is, they're still the moderators right now. What are lessons learned um, 
that they, I hope, have communicated to the moderator search committee about a team. So they didn't learn anything? No, they did. <laughs> yeah, I was going to nominate Kim Hampton I'm, to give an answer. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to do that without breaking some confidences with them. Um, but the, the part of the reason we keep talking about balance is that they have um, both Alandria and Barb talked about the need for balance and being able to communicate with each other, having and having reasonable assurance that both will be heard or all parties in it will be heard. Um, so I, I think that's the the biggest one really is balance. And um, I don't think I'm breaking confidence by saying, actually to go back to the last question, both um, Alandria and Barb were very, very clear about the about their belief that the moderator should be non-ordained. And because of power issues in, in how the relationship between the moderator works with the board and, and just how people view somebody who is ordained. So and, it, and how the moderator works with the staff with, with Susan right. and Perry. So so there so there's balance. Balance seems to be the word of the day. Um and of course the number is two. Um if if we're doing a Sesame Street reference. Um so balance grounding in a lot of ways that one thing I think the our committee has learned is spiritual grounding really is important and if you don't have it you're going to get burned out really quick so those two balance and grounding are the things that they learned do candidates need to fundraise I would say um, probably a very little, um, largely because of the time frame. Um, historically, the you know the, we we would have had a candidate um, a year ago, um, or eight to even eighteen months ago for election at this past GA, and so there would be this long period between candidacy and the election. Um, the slate of candidates won't be announced until early December. Um, and then petitions, if anyone decides to run by petition, um, those petitions aren't due until the 1st of February. So there's not a lot of time for quote unquote campaigning, nor is there a big appetite to encourage some big, you know, hoo-ha around campaigning, because fundraising is not the essence of this job. We really want people to focus on, you know, preparing themselves. Normally, when congregations are interested in having folks talk to them, to candidates talk to them, you know, they'll invite them and pay for them to come. We've got so much technology available. Um, whether it's through, you know, email or Facebook or, or you know, uh, these kinds of calls that I would say it's really not a big, big focus and that shouldn't hold anybody back. When you say by petition, what does that mean? If a candidate is not nominated by the Board of Trustees, it's ultimately the board who decides who goes on the, the ballot. Uh, a candidate or candidates can petition, i.e. apply to be on the ballot without having been nominated by the board. And those petitions are due February 1st. I also, just for clarification's sake, this is the completion of a term. Um, 
so because we didn't have any candidates and Barb and Lalandry agreed to continue for another year, this is a position that starts at the end of GA 2020 and only goes till 2025. Um, so A, that's why there's a short turnaround, but also it's not a full six year um, term. It's also so, a long term when I was looking I mean, I wasn't looking at it, but when I was just curious, I was like, that's a long time. So talk to me about teams. Um, so I know that you you all have said teams a lot, you know, the number of the day is two, apparently. Um, and you, you're all mentioning, you know, balance and uh, uh, the, the current co-moderator team. Have we figured out how that works organizationally? nominating a team to be co-moderators and uh, in the, according to the letter and the spirit of the bylaws and all that kind of stuff. Or we just, like we just go on, we just go on with it because we like it. Because I'm okay with that. Ah! I just know that there would be people asking about that if we were live. Denise? I'm, I'm hoping Denise will answer that because she probably knows the bylaws in this better than I do. So there was actually a lot, of, it's a great question, Michael, thank you. Um, there was a lot of conversation at the very beginning with the co-presidents and then subsequently co-moderators about will the bylaws allow us to do it. Bylaws don't say anything specifically prohibiting it, so it's okay. Um, and that's, you know, we, we talked with our legal counsel, we talked amongst ourselves, we got input from others. Um, and so the bylaws really don't speak to that. And we um, actually, you know, there could be more than two people. There could be three people. One of the most important lessons that we learned in this first go round with co-moderators is um, we don't, um, we didn't do a great job. The board didn't do a great job of specifying um, anything from a covenantal perspective uh, with regard to this new model uh, of co-leadership. We didn't do much of anything, quite frankly, with regard to role clarity. So that meant that some things were being done twice and other things weren't being done at all through no fault of anyone's per se. It's just one of those, those are things that you learn as you go. So there's been a lot of work since then, um, and it, it continues to put, uh, put some of that down on paper. Um, you know, Barb and Alandria have spent the past two and a half, three years um, running the governance of the association and building out this new, this new configuration. So they've really had two jobs. Um, which adds time to everything. Uh, but role clarity is becoming um, much more pronounced. A covenant will be required for any candidates applying. Uh, they, they have, when they apply, there has to be a covenant in place. Um, so nice. that we know they've, they've talked about that. Um, and so I think we'll do a better job um, we aren't putting together, the nominating committee is not putting together any teams. That's another thing we decided very early on. You know, if there are two great candidates um, who are running individually, um, we're not saying, why don't you, you, you all team up? Or if somebody comes to us and says, I'd like a running mate, so to speak. Um, number one, because of the time constraints, we have a very short turnaround time. Uh, in terms of, of putting together the slate to present to the board. And because people need to figure this out, candidates need to figure this out for themselves to make it as strong as it can be. Yeah, and I think, you know, we have, um, there's so much that they're gonna have to do hit, literally hitting the ground running, that if they don't already have a sense of their working relationship where they haven't worked together before, that's a learning curve on its own, not, you know, beyond learning how to, to work with the board, beyond learning how to relate to staff, to our congregations, and the issues that they're taking up. I mean, we're looking at bylaw changes no matter what. 
So there's a lot to do hitting the ground running. So we're hoping that the teams that, if teams apply, um, that there's some evidence that they're having worked together, knowing each other's styles, um, having already found some of that balance. Of course, you know, the other team, uh, teamwork that's important is with the, uh, the president and executive vice president, you know, in addition to just the team of the board. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering, I, and I guess not to, to reference particular people, but we can all think. Um, I've been in system, in the, in the system when uh, there's been tension is putting it mildly between uh, the board and the and the president of the UUA. And I know Susan is on the board, uh, so she will have a voice in the board's nomination of a moderator. But how much are you paying attention to how someone would work with Susan and Carrie? And of course, Susan's term ends in the middle of this moderator or co-moderator's term. So how do you weigh that? Anyone want to jump in on that? Nobody wants to go for that. Well, um, part of it is um, that I'm trying to figure out how to word this. Um, how the person or persons who apply for this moderator position, they don't have to have been have voted for Susan to be the moderator. What they what they do need to understand is Susan's vision and be able to sign on to it, at least if not in all, but in good part. Because it does, and I remember those board meetings where the moderator and the president were not in sync at all. And Michael, yes, you were being very nice about that. Um, and it's where it was outright hostile. So at this point in time, it's it just, it's better if they, again, if they sign on to the vision, even if they weren't a Susan supporter at the time of the presidential election, because there's a lot of work to do. And if you have competing visions, nothing's going to get done. So, so I guess what I'm hearing, and tell me if I'm hearing this incorrectly, is you would expect someone to be in good faith, willing to like, support the governance that, that allows the president to, to do their job. Right. I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> good, good faith is the right word, yeah. or, or the right words. And I, I would say just my observation, and, and, and I know others have seen this as well. I mean, Susan, Carrie McDonald, the um, executive vice president, is also at every board meeting um, and for all intents and purposes, ex officio on the board. And they have been incredibly accommodating uh, in terms of helping the board find its way in this new model and supporting the co-moderators with their workload. So, um, you know, from a, from a personal perspective, um, in, in terms of getting help, <clears throat> excuse me, help and support, I mean, I can't speak highly enough of the partnership that I experienced with Susan and Carrie. And as former um, UUA nominating committee person, uh, member and chair, uh, I also witnessed the same thing with Susan and Carrie and the board is that there was, um, there's value in collaboration. And I think one of the most disappointing things about um, the word that popped up for me when you were speaking, Michael, was the troubles, um, was A, how public it was and how like we really can't be grownups. Like this is what we're modeling for congregations. Why though? I mean, I listen, not that I'm, you know, a stranger to controversy and um, w w wouldn't it be great if we can model disagreement, um, working through difficulties, because that's what we need to learn to do as grownups and, and rooted in faith, that it's not just a battle of two people who's, you know, whatever. It's, it's about, we're, we're all 
signing on to the same faith. And so we may have different visions. However, there's value in working together. So I, I want to also affirm um, how what, what I witnessed um, as part of the nominating committee was the faithfulness of all involved, the board, the moderators, Susan and Carrie, of affirming everyone that we are all in this together, even when it gets difficult, almost especially when it gets difficult. So. So in our little bit of time left, I'd really like to know why would anyone want to do this? Why? Give us Best some question ever. <laughs> it really is a great question. And I think there are people who just un want to be part of the, the incredible work we're doing, who want to get into it, who want to see us grow and, and live into, you know, our vision of, of who we can be. Um, and I, I, I think there's an appeal of working with an incredible group of people to affect real change. You know, a, a, in a conversation with Alandria, she said, you know, we think of ourselves as small, but we're talking, you know, well over 100,000 people over a thousand congregations and that's not tiny and we do have an effect and I think people will want if people want to apply it in part it's just to have you know a part in that there's an awful <clears throat> there's an awful lot of joy that comes out of the work um, I served as vice moderator when I was on the board and right uh, as after Jim Key resigned and from the time he resigned until Alandria and Barb started, I served as, as the acting or interim moderator. Um, and it was not, that time was not reflective of what the job is really like, obviously. It was right before GA, we'd had a lot of trauma, but um, the people and the, that you get to meet and work with and the, the love and the joy um, and the passion that you get to experience. And you can find that many other places, but as hard as it was at that time, I mean, they, they're, it will be one, one of the, the saddest and yet most joyful times I have ever experienced as an adult. To be able to get things done with the, with the help of, with other people that helps people and helps bring them deeper into the faith is, is indescribable and it's worth the it was worth the work you have a last word for us kim um i'm always a joy there is joy in the work and you know the psalm says darkness may endure for a night but joy cometh in the morning so um there there is joy in the work and for those who are thinking about it as the committee has heard me say it's you know my days are filled with trying to figure out if i'm going to change a pamper at before she takes a nap or after she takes a nap in the grand scheme of things we love while we love unitarian universalism it's not everything and if you go into the work understanding that it's not everything and that you can find joy in it, everything will be all right. Things will work themselves out. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're sorry about our, our technical difficulties. Um, this has been The View. Next week's show is a mystery to us still. It's so a surprise, Michael, it's a surprise. Great. We have a surprise guest. Uh, uh, but we trust that you will be out there joining us and um, we might even be live next week. So this has uh, been, oh, Denise. If you have questions or you want more information, moderator search committee, all one word, moderator search committee at uua.org. Awesome. And a well, quick I shout hope out you to get... our other three members, Chloe Aki, Matthew Johnson, and Lauren Way. Yay. Uh, I hope you get many, many applicants. This has been The View. Have a great week. <laughs>